one of the items that we store here in the researchers room is particular to George Washington Carver. One day in 1939, George Washington Carver was working in his lab and this gentleman comes to him and visits him. He's a farmer and he says, look, I found this large stone in my field and I wanna know what it is. The reason why is because the farmer, as did George Washington Carver, they knew that we don't have large stones in our fields here in Macon County. We have sand and pebbles. So what was interesting is that this large rock was unique and the farmer asked Carver about it. Now this shows you the brilliance of Carver. He had probably never seen one of these in his life, he, but he knew what it was when he saw it. And what he saw was a meteorite. The meteorite was about this long, weighed about 207 pounds, and it was very different. Now, the farmer gave it to Carver, and Carver kept it in his possession until he died, and then when he died, everything came to the university. He willed everything that he owned to the university. Now, because of that, we were able to create the George Washington Carver Museum, which is here on campus. Now, long before the National Park Service took over the ownership of that museum, it was handled by the university. So in 1969, the National Meteoritic Museum in Albuquerque, New Mexico, sent out to have a database built of all the meteorites that had landed in the United States, the continental United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. What they were hoping to do, build that database so they could use it to compare other meteorites that would land eventually in our continent. Now, the National Meteoritic Museum is part of the University of New Mexico Systems, and that group sent out geologists from all different parts of the country to help identify some of these meteorites. Well, they sent one from Auburn University to Tuskegee, and I suspect he thought he was coming to see a meteorite about this big. When he got here, he saw the Carver meteorite, and it surprised him. You see, the thing is, it's a meteor when it's in space, but when it passes through the atmosphere, it becomes a meteorite. Most meteorites are made up of iron and nickel. So when he saw the meteorite here, how large it was, he says, we want to take it back and have it tested. So they had it tested at the National Meteoritic Museum and found out that it was one of a kind. It was made up of iron and cobalt. So the director of the National Meteoritic Museum contacted the director of the Carver Museum at that time and asked her if he could cut it in half and send half of it back to the university with 10 other meteorites. What happened to those, I don't know. They came back in 1971, I do know that, but I don't know what happened to them. They could have gotten misplaced during the transition between the university's ownership and the National Park Service, but we really don't know what happened to them. What we do know is that we learned about this quite by accident, and so we contacted the National Meteoritic Museum and asked them if we could have a piece of the half that they have so that we could put it on display here at the university. They wrote me back and told me that they don't cut their meteorites anymore. So what they decided to do was that they would send me the information regarding their acquisition of their part. But I don't take no for an answer. So what we did was we kept after them and four months later I get an email followed by a letter saying that they were going to give us a part of the meteorite that had been cut, a slab that had been cut in 1971, 
They put it on display and put the rest of the ba meteorite back in the back for testing purposes. Now that slab was in a hermetically sealed case. And what they did was they sent that piece to us at the cost of several thousand dollars to remove it from that case and then build a new case in its place. Not counting the value of the meteorite itself and the insurance, et cetera, that they had to pay. When it got here, we decided that we wanted the public to be able to see this. And besides researchers, we have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of school-age children that come through the archives to visit us on a yearly basis. Now, those that come get to see this meteorite and to hold it because I believe that they should be able to um, experience the meteorite and all of them, all of them to the last one are so thrilled with getting the opportunity to hold a meteorite. So let me show you what I'm talking about. This is the George Washington Carver meteorite. And what makes this special? Well, many of you thought that it was going to be round, but it isn't. It has a very distinct shape. And some of you, no doubt, have already seen what the shape is similar to. It's similar to the shape of Africa. Well, let me turn it around. You can see the horn and the breast of Africa. Now, I think that's very ironic that we have here at Tuskegee a meteorite that's one of a kind at this HBCU in the shape of Africa.